Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, colloquium in the winter quarter. Uh, I am very honored to introduce our speaker today, Kathy McKeown, as our uh, first distinguished lecturer this quarter. Uh, Kathy McKeown is uh, one of the NLP leaders in the area of natural language processing and also data science uh, in the world, let's say. Uh, she is a professor at Columbia University and a founding director of the Data Science Institute. She is also an Amazon scholar, I learned today about that. <laughs> Uh, her work is mainly in natural language processing and using big data, and uh, her group works on many different research areas, including text summarization and gener uh, generation, uh, also question answering, uh, and also some work in, uh, or a lot of work in analyzing social media text. Uh, she has received a lot of awards. It's hard for me to remember all of them and name them. So just to name uh, a few of them, uh, she is an elected member of uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she is a founding fellow of ACL, a fellow of AAAI, uh, and also some of her earlier awards include a uh, Presidential Young Investigator Award and many others. Okay, so today she will talk about NLP and social good. Thank you. Okay, thanks Hannah for that introduction and um, thank you also for inviting me here. I haven't been on campus for a while and I really enjoyed uh, walking around earlier and seeing some of it again. Okay, so as uh, text on the web has grown, um, our group at Columbia has become interested in seeing how we can make use of that data to solve problems that would benefit society. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the work our group at Columbia has been doing over the last uh, five years um, to address societal needs. Now, as we all know, data on the web doesn't only come in English. Um, we have text data in many different languages and societal problems occur in many different countries. Um, furthermore, if we look at uh, text that appears in various online genres, often the language is so different from standard American English that we also need to look at taking an approach that is quite different from our usual approaches in NLP. So uh, my vision is to be able to analyze, develop systems that can analyze social media for insight into events in the world and generate presentations that connect events personal accounts, um, and answers to questions. As is the case for almost everybody in NLP nowadays, uh, we take a machine learning approach. We start with data, which is often labeled. Um, we extract features from the text data, and we also look at uh, representational learning. And we use that uh, to be able to predict output for the problems and the tasks that we're working on. Um, since my research is not in machine learning, the kinds of questions that I'm interested in are what data is available for learning and what features and representations yield good predictions. Um, I'm going to uh, talk today about work over a period of time. I'll start with work that um, is a little further back and so it uh, we'll take the approach of extracting features from data, and then I'll move to the last two-thirds of the talk on representational learning. Uh, so I'm going to look at this within the context of three problems, uh, disasters, uh, the ability to access global information produced around the world, and then the third context is um, in the scenario of analyzing posts made by gang-involved youth on social media. So turning first to our work on disasters, uh, the first problem that I'm going to talk about is being able to provide updates during a disaster. Um, 
So we want to develop a system that can tell us as the disaster progresses over days, can each day provide us with an update on what's new. So this is um, equivalent to a problem of monitoring events over time. Uh, we're taking as input streaming data. It can be either news um, or web pages. And at every hour, we want to produce a summary which tells us what's new, what happened now which we didn't know about before. So ultimately, uh, we might like to use this to be able to track events and the sub-events that they um, spur. So for example, when Hurricane Sandy uh, hit New York, um, it caused a blackout in Manhattan. This was a follow-on event. Um, it uh, ha caused a fire in Breezy Point, which was an area in um, Brooklyn. And it caused flooding in the subway, so a public transit outage. So these are all events that we would like to be able to pick up and report on. Uh, for this problem, we're using data that was collected by NIST for a challenge called the Temporal Summarization Challenge. Um, and this is data that was collected by uh, use, doing a two-year web crawl um, in the period 2011 to 2013 in 11 different categories of disaster. Um, so some of them are shown here. There is data on protests, on terrorist events, on bombings, and so forth. So in this scenario, um, the system is going to take in documents over the course of an hour, shown here just four, but um, in the real context, we would have far more than that. And the system will then generate a summary at the end of an hour. So shown here is um, a summary that the system generated for um, a particular disaster in the NIST data, an earthquake that hit in Guatemala. And you can see in the first summary, the first update, it provides information uh, about what happened, the earthquake hit, about where it hit, the magnitude of the quake, and so forth. Um, in the next hour, after getting the next sequence of text, it will produce a new update, and it has to, but it has to avoid producing the information that it uh, produced so far for this update. So for this work, uh, we took a temporal summarization approach. Um, we divide time up into time slices, and at each time t, uh, we want to first predict which sentences in our input data are salient and are worthy of being included in the summary. This is what is called um, an extractive approach to summarization because we're extracting full sentences, including those sentences verbatim in the summary. And uh, here we use features that are specific to the disaster to help us in uh, being able to predict salience. Having selected salient sentences, we have to remove those that are redundant with what was already reported. We still will have far more um, information or sentences than we can include in a summary, and so at this point we cluster, we use um, an affinity propagation clustering algorithm where we can incorporate salience prediction as a prior, and then from each cluster we'll select exemplar sentences to form the summary. So um, some of the features that we use, we make use of language models. Uh, we have a generic language model that was built from um, News Corporum. We use 10 years of AP and New York Times articles. And this kind of language model will score a sentence by how typical it is of the language. So a higher score in this case means a sentence that is more fluent. And this is useful in this context because um, since we're taking sentences from web pages, we often will have sentences that are ill-formed or noisy in some way, and that language model can help us um, filter those out. 
The domain-specific language model is um, more interesting. Um, here we create different language models for each type of domain that we're looking at. So we'll have one for earthquakes, one for protests, and so forth, um, which we train by using um, disaster-related articles in the category drawn from Wikipedia. And this uh, kind of language model will score a sentence by how typical it is of the disaster type. So it would help us to get, for example, in the context of an earthquake, um, sentences that are more typical of earthquakes. So here, for example, our disaster model related to earthquakes will score the first sentence um, more highly because it contains phrases that we would expect to see in the context of an earthquake, like local tsunami alert or d disaster management. These are phrases that we would see in the context of an earthquake, but not, for example, in the context of a, of a terrorist event. Um, but we want to make sure that we're not extracting sentences about any old earthquake. Rather, we want the particular event that we're reporting on on this point in time. So we also use geographic features. Um, we tag the input with a named entity tagger. Uh, we then get coordinates for locations and mean distance to the event. And this kind of feature will again give a higher score to the first sentence here because Nicaragua is closer to Guatemala than Mexico City. Um, finally, we also use features, semantic features, um, so that we can recognize words that are related to the event that we're interested in. Uh, so we use a number of different event type synonyms, hypernyms, or hipponyms. So here, for example, in the first sentence, we have a hypernym uh, to earthquakes. So again, we'll get a slightly higher score. So what have we learned here? Um, in this graph, the red line uh, represents the results for our system. Uh, so this uses both the affinity propagation clustering and the salience predict uh, predictions. Uh, the blue line is affinity propagation clustering only, so how do we do when we drop those salience features? The purple line is hierarchical agglomerative clustering, and this is what uh, was used in summarization up to that uh, point in time. And then we also looked at a ranking to search. And we can see that the salience predictions lead to high precision quickly, so we're looking over the course of time here on the x-axis. Um, and they also allow us to more quickly recover more information that would be relevant to the event. So this work was done before uh, neural methods, um, only four years ago. But um, so since then, we've been uh, ex exploring uh, neural summarization methods for extraction. And our work in, in our work in this area, we found that simpler is better. Um, there have been a number of models proposed that use um, RNNs or CNNs for um, encoding. And we find that uh, word averaging um, works just as well, and pre-trained embeddings are better than uh, relearning them. We're currently working on being able to incorporate representations that would come from information extraction. So for examples of entities and locations in a neural model to help us um, better identify events. So um, we've also been interested in how we can summarize personal experiences. For people who have lived through the disaster, uh, what did they experience? And um, this is a quite different kind of text. Where this requires looking at personal narratives that occur online. This is an example of one about um, Hurricane Sandy. And we can see that it follows a structure that was identified by a, a linguist, um, William LaBeouf, who studied personal narrative. Um, it starts out with a background. We were sitting down to a late dinner on Monday night when the storm was supposed to hit. 
It then goes into a series of these complicating actions. By 10 p.m., the skies lit up in a purple and blue brilliance, and the power started to go out here and there. That's when I noticed neighbors across the street running out of their homes and fire trucks racing down the block. I saw a trickle of steady water coming down the street on both sides, and then water began pouring in through the creeks in the basement door. Um, and then finally, in this story, we have uh, what LeBov called the most reportable event. Um, this is the moment of sort of life and death in the story, the um, climax. And here we have, he went upstairs to get a tool, and in those few seconds, ocean waves broke the steel door lock and flooded the basement six feet high in minutes. So our goal in summarizing these stories is be, to be able to find and extract the most reportable event. Um, and we hypothesize that this reportable event could serve as a summary for what is this story about. So uh, for this task, for the data, we used uh, data from Reddit. We used the Ask Reddit subreddit um, with prompts. So here, for example, is the prompt, what's your creepiest real life story? And we had a number of these different prompts by which we could gather these personal narratives. For our experiments, we used uh, 3,000 stories. But um, of course, you know, this is a method by which we could get more. Um, and then a small amount of them we manually labeled the most reportable event and often some of the different um, elements of a, of a narrative. Um, we had Columbia students do that and this gave us a seed um, number of stories that were well annotated, you know, it was more of a high quality annotation. Um, but it's time consuming and very hard to get a lot of them. Um, so we also used um, a large amount of automatically labeled data, um, making use of super distance supervision. And we used a number of different heuristics to do that. One example is TLDR, um, too long didn't read, where um, we would have some sort of summary of the story by a person, and we looked at semantic similarity between the TLDR and different sentences in the narrative, um, where the sentence with the highest semantic similarity would be uh, labeled as the most reportable event. Um, for our approach, we uh, draw from linguistic theory. So um, Gerald Prince argued that stories are about change. Um, Pogliani noted that the turning point in a story is marked by change in formality, style, and emphasis. And LeBov uh, noted that the MRE is often accompanied in text by a change in the verb tense. So we wanted to look, m monitor these changes over the course of the story and use them to help pick out uh, the most reportable event. We looked at the different kinds of things we could model as um, scores which might change. So we had syntactic scores. So one example would be uh, sentence length. We could also look at sentence complexity in terms of the parse tree. Um, for sentence length, we reasoned that, for example, if the rest of the story was told with very long sentences, the most reportable event might suddenly switch to a short one to give emphasis. Um, we use semantic scores looking at similarity to surrounding sentences, um, hypothesizing that the most reportable event would be a break with the story that came before. And then we use scores reflecting affect drawn from the dictionary of affect and language. Um, and so this is a dictionary that for each word contains scores along three dimensions. For each word, how pleasant it's, is it? how active, so how intense is the language, um, and how much does the word evoke an image of something in the real world. And uh, so you can see here a plot where we have um, some changes in affect noted across the course of a narrative. Um, 
So here we would be looking at averages or, or min and max we also looked at within a sentence um, as we progressed tr through the story. And our hypothesis is that the most reportable event shown here with the red line would occur at either a min or a max um, in these scores. Uh, we looked at other features also, so tense of the main verb and um, inner sentence shifts in tense, um, the position of the sentence in the narrative, and the semantic similarity of the sentence with the beginning sentences um, of the narrative. So what have we learned here? Um, well, uh, we've lear we learned that our change features of the different features we looked at were the most effective. Um, we also experimented with how to use the data. Um, so we experimented with the seed data only, which was small, but nonetheless very accurate. Um, we also experimented with the distantly supervised data, which gave us a lot more, but it was noisy. And then we tried an approach of self-training where we used the seed data first to generate a model, labeled the data, and then retained to augment the data, only those results that match um, what the distant supervision gave us, so two sources to feed it back. And we can see that the self-training uh, does the best here. We actually get quite a big boost in recall, but also a boost in precision. Um, so the biggest problem when dealing uh, with this kind of summer data for summarization is that the summaries look, if, if we look at, have people summarize them and look at what a good summary would be, um, the summaries themselves would include substantial rephrasing. Um, over how the original personal narrative was presented. And this is because um, online, on social media, the language is very informal. We can get run-on sentences. We have a lot of pronouns. Um, we have a lot of interjections, which are sort of content-free. Um, so in order to do a good job on generating an abstract, we really need a lot of paraphrasing. Um, and so one of the things that uh, we looked at next was uh, a model for aligning the sentences of the, and the phrases within the sentences of the extract with a manually gen generated um, abstract. Uh, and this is work that uh, we reported on an ACL this summer. It's a neural model to align sort of what we call sentential paraphrases because uh, they are fairly extreme. And in future work, we're looking at being able to generate those paraphrases. So I'll turn now to our work on global information access. Um, as I alluded to in the beginning, disasters don't just happen in the US. We see them happening around the world. And often, they happen in countries where uh, we don't have good machine translation, and furthermore, we don't have a lot of resources in that language or, in, or paired with English in order to develop good machine translation. Um, and here are a few um, examples. Um, so we have been looking at developing cross-lingual summarization for these uh, low-resource languages. Here the task is, given a document in one language, our low resource language, um, we want to be able to summarize it in English, in another language, and for us that's English. Um, there are two different approaches to this task. One would be to first summarize the document in the low resource language and then translate the summary. And the other would be to translate the low resource document and then summarize the translation. But when we're dealing with low resource languages, we have little to no data to train our summarization systems. We certainly do not have, within the low resource um, language, pairs of documents and summaries that we can use for training. And if we're looking across languages from the foreign language to English, um, there are very few 
languages for which this kind of corpora has been developed. I think Chinese is one of the few cases, and recently I saw some work on developing that for um, Spanish. Um, so in our approach, uh, given the lack of data in the low resource language, we have to take the approach to translate and then summarize, but our machine translation is going to be poor. Um, and we also have this problem of pairs from the foreign language uh, to the English. Um, we're working on with a, a large team on this, so uh, we have machine translation that's being developed at University of Maryland and also at Edinburgh. This is an example of what the machine translation produces for a weblog in Swahili. And so you can see that it's not very fluent. Um, it may be hard to get a good idea of what even what the weblog is about. We, as people, can probably make some inferences this is a person named Manja Kambabi who's uh, running for parliament. Um, and then it says, not special seats, kin and doni without drugs as po possible. So probably he's running on a platform related to um, drug use, reducing drug use in the country. So um, we reason that this is a good task for which to apply abstractive summarization. So in contrast to extractive summarization and abstractive summarization, uh, we would take sentences from the input, but we would rewrite them. Um, we may um, introduce synonyms. We may change the syntax and so forth. Um, so we, the first thing that we needed was data. Um, and we created a multilingual summarization corpus by taking a summarization corpus in English, the New York Times summarization corpus, which has um, news articles in English paired with news summaries in English. And we translated those documents into the low resource language. Here we were working with Tagalog, Swahili, and Somali, um, and then back into English again. So this gave us documents now that are noisy, very much like the first one I showed you. Uh, so we have noisy documents, but we have well-written English summaries, and they're paired. So this looks closer to the kind of um, scenario we have in our system. Uh, so our data, we use the New York Times document summary pairs. We translated 112,000 of them into each of S Somali, Swahili, and Tagalog um, using uh, neural MT systems um, developed in our larger project, and then we translated them back to English. Um, this gives you an idea of what these synthetic translations look like. So, they're not quite as bad as uh, the translation of the weblog. First of all, of course, they are um, Newswire, which is a genre that our systems are more used to dealing with. But you can still see some of the same problems. So if you look in the sen second sentence in his comments on January 0, he praised the consultation of the community of Kansas City, which half of the participants failed. So again, you know, disfluent, and we may not have a great idea of what it's about. So the abstraction model that um, we developed was a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with copy attention and coverage. This is the standard abstraction model that has been um, used in uh, the summarization community and neural net approach. We pre-trained for 12 ep epics on the unmodified New York Times, so in English. And then we trained this baseline for another eight epics on 100,000 synthetic translations um, each from each of the three languages. Um, we also tried mixed corpus training. So we took 100,000 of these synthetic translations um, randomly from across the three languages, ending up with an equal amount in each language. And then we had a validation set of 6,000 for parameter to me. 
So he, here are, are, is the performance of our baseline shown on the top line. And uh, the metric that we use here is one that's commonly used in summarization called Rouge. Rouge 1, for example, looks at uh, word overlap, so unigram overlap between um, a system generated output and a model summary. So here we have the model summaries from the, from the New York Times. And Rouge 2 would look for uh, bigram overlap. Um, these are two state of the art systems at the point in time of this paper. Um, and you can see we get similar results. We didn't care about absolutely getting the top results because we want to look at the comparison between how this would do and our new model trained on our cross-lingual corpus. So first for evaluation, we did a sanity check by evaluating on a held out test set of 6,000 of these synthetic translations. And I'm showing here the results for um, the summaries generated from the Tagalog data set. And you can see that um, our results trained on Tagalog are better than our results trained in either of the other languages. Um, and we do get a significant improvement over the baseline. The training on the mixed corpus is slightly better. Um, and so that's, that's encouraging. Uh, but we also wanted to do a real world evaluation. What happens when we take web logs from um, each language and uh, summarize them using machine translation in the loop? Uh, we don't have any model summaries for this, so no gold standard. So we needed to use a human evaluation. Um, so we had five human evaluators, and we asked them to score the summaries along two dimensions, um, content, how informative was the summary, and fluency. And they scored from one to three, where three was higher. Well, we expected to do well on fluency. That's what we wanted and thought we would do well, better on fluency than the baseline. And in fact, you can see quite a bit of improvement. This is for the Swahili uh, weblogs. Um, and we did equally well training on the Swahili data set versus the mixed data set. What we were surprised about was that we all, the system also did better on content. And so we can see that um, the mixed data set gives us the highest scores on content. And we think this is because with a more fluent summary, it's easier for the end user to understand uh, what's being said. And the results are similar for other languages. So if we go back to our example, um, now the document is color coded uh, for how information is copied from the document into the summary. This is our baseline system summary at the bottom. And you can see that most of the copying happens from the first sentence. So large uh, chunks of it are copied and uh, placed into the summary. There's this extra little information is on blog, which gets in there. And so we don't have much of an improvement on fluency when we um, use this approach. But when we use our system trained on the mixed corpus, um, again, we can see some copying from the input. But then we have copying from different places. So uh, to vie for, which appears on the end, kin and doni without drugs, and some language that is newly generated con comments on his plans. And this gives us a better idea that Manja Kimbabi is uh, running on a plan for kin and doni without drugs. So what have we learned here? Um, well, summaries are a good target for in improving fluency in this cross-lingual case, uh, making use of ex abstractive approaches. Um, we've provided a new multilingual summarization corpus and a method for gaining that kind of corpus in um, any language pair. Uh, I showed that it improved on the languages that we trained on, but I didn't show we also tested it on unseen languages. So we looked at Arabic um, using 
um, model summaries that were produced in an earlier summarization task, and we also got improvement there. So our, our current directions, uh, one of the big problems with either neural language generation or abstractive summarization using neural methods is that systems tend to hallucinate. They hallucinate phrases that um, were not represented in the input, and they also can make errors in doing the generation. So um, we're beginning to look at what kind of training we can do to avoid those hallucinations. And uh, we've piloted an approach in a language generation task, so not summarization. Um, here, this was a task to generate restaurant reviews where our input is structured data in attribute value pairs and our output is a short text paragraph giving a review. And we looked at methods to do um, data augmentation and then self-training um, on that data. And we'll begin to look now at how we can do similar things uh, in summarization. So in this area, we've also looked at um, how we can use sentiment analysis uh, for the task of um, helping in the context of a disaster now around the world. Um, the goal is we want to analyze the subjective posts of everyday people and identify sentiment and emotion um, in those posts. But again, it could be in a low resource language. Um, and the idea is if we find negative sentiment or negative emotion, this is an area where problems likely still per persist, whereas positive sentiment or emotion can indicate where um, the problem has resolved. Um, and given the lack of data, we're looking at creating these models without machine translation. So we've developed a, an approach called direct transfer where um, we train the sentiment model on a high resource language where we do have labeled data. So we do have lots of labeled data in English for sentiment where we have, for example, Twitter posts where each post is labeled as being either positive, negative, or neutral. Um, and we can use that to train the system. But in the neural approach, rather than using um, English word embeddings, we now train a set of bilingual word embeddings, and we use those as features in the sentiment model. And when we train it, then we can directly create a model for transferring sentiment to the low resource language. Um, one of the things that we've experimented with here are uh, what kind of data we have available and how it impacts um, the training of these cross-lingual embeddings and what works best. Uh, so we looked at the use of in-domain parallel corpus. So if we're dealing with disaster, an in-domain parallel corpus would be uh, Twitter, for example, that reports on disaster. And we would want to have uh, paired uh, sentences, both in our low resource and our high resource language. Um, that could be hard to find, so we also look at out-of-domain parallel corpus. We, there is a lot of that available um, using the Bible and the Quran, because the Bible and the Quran have been translated to almost all languages. Um, but as you can imagine, this is very out of domain. The language is not very similar to what we find in Twitter. Um, <laughs> and probably it's not talking about disaster either, although sometimes it is. <laughs> um, we also looked at what's called comparable corpora. So this uh, would be, for example, you can think about Wikipedia, where we have English Wikipedia and the foreign language Wikipedia. And we may have articles on the same topic, for example, on the same uh, disaster. Um, but they're not translations of each other, so they're not parallel. But they're likely to contain some translation somewhere. Uh, in the two articles. And then finally, what if we don't have any of that? All we have is a monolingual corpus. Um, so we did this experiment in uh, 17 languages in five broad language families. Some of them are high resource languages like Portuguese or Spanish, but we did it in a low resource context with less data. 
Um, some of the low resource languages are uh, Sinhalese, Uyghur, or Tigrinya. Um, this is the model architecture that we use. So it's a um, bi-directional LSTM. This allows us to um, have help with languages that have different word order. Um, and we use uh, pre-trained cross-lingual word embeddings for them as, as input. And we also experimented with uh, some sentiment features, so bilingual sentiment embeddings and bilingual sentiment scores. Um, these embeddings and weights are pre-trained, and so you can uh, see them um, at the bottom. Um, and then uh, we also looked at um, bilingual features. So suppose we only have the monolingual, a large amount of monolingual data, but we have a small amount of a parallel corpus. Well, we can build a, bi a bilingual dictionary from the small parallel corpus, and then we can take the large monolingual corpus and we can replace each word in the low resource language with the, far with the translation. Then we get this what's a code switched partial translation of the training data, and this um, does allow us to update the parallel embeddings. So this is um, a large chart. You don't need to understand the details. Across the bottom are all of the different languages. The yellow bars are if we had labeled data in the foreign language, what is the, how could we do? And that's sort of our upper bound. The gray is the R approach, the direct transfer, and the others are um, some baseline systems. And what we see is that transfer outperforms the baseline. It lags behind the supervised model by about 15 points on average. So what lessons have we learned here? If we have an in-domain parallel corpus, even if it's small, um, we will do the best there. If it's not available, then the order in which you want to use resources are first out of domain parallel, then comparable, and then monolingual data. And the best features we have found are embeddings learned on the bilingual con context. If we have a data set, evaluation data set that has a lot of sentiment in it, then the bilingual sentiment embeddings are best. And target language lexicalization helps. So in the last part of the talk, I want to turn to our work on analyzing the posts of gang-involved youth. Um, the background uh, for this would be the large amount of firearm-related deaths that happen in the US and the fact that violence disproportionately impacts um, low-income cities uh, like uh, Chicago, for example, which had more than 3,000 shooting victims in 2015. So we're doing this work in collaboration with uh, Desmond Patton, a faculty member from Social Work, who looked at the parallel between studied uh, social media, which he calls the digital street, and saw that it paralleled what happens on the physical street. And violence is exasperated by taunting that occurs on the digital street. Furthermore, he saw that violence was often triggered by trauma. So prior to aggressive posts, there would have been some traumatic event. In his work, he was studying um, a girl, really, named um, Jakaira Barnes, um, who was a recently deceased gang member in Chicago. And she became gang involved at the age of 13 after um, her friend Taekwon, assass uh, Taekwon was uh, shot and killed. And at that point, she renamed her Twitter handle um, Taekwon Assassin. And she was unusual in that she was very prolific on social media. So she had some 27,000 posts to her name in a three year period and had roughly 4,000 followers on Twitter. Now, if we look at this data, um, it is a challenge for current uh, natural language systems, which are primarily trained on news. Um, the language is quite different and um, would not be handled by um, many of the, for example, parsers or part of speech taggers that we've developed. 
So we work closely with the social work team um, who do analysis and annotation of this data. They also ha bring in as part of their team youth from Chicago who were formerly um, gang involved who can uh, provide interpretation for the different posts. Um, from this, we have about 5,000 labeled tweets uh, from Jakaira and her top communicators, and one of the things they have seen is that context is critical in interpretation. Um, we also have a much larger number of unlabeled tweets from um, 279 different posters um, that were gathered in a, so finding the posters was um, gathered in a snowball sampling fashion. So we can see here some example of the annotation. Um, they do a very fine-grained analysis, so they would annotate the first tweet as a threat and the second tweet as an insult, um, but they both are um, categorized as aggression. And at this point in time, doing, well, binary, really, three-way categorization is as much as we could hope for. And the bottom one um, about loss, um, where somebody is mourning the loss of death of their friend, Shorty. So our goal for natural language processing is to develop a system that can predict for unseen tweets whether they express aggression, loss, or some other information. And we want to be able to exploit the unlabeled data set in doing that. Um, our ultimate goal in developing this tool um, is to develop something uh, that community outreach workers can use to intervene and avert violence that could happen either when aggression is expressed or at an earlier point when people first experience loss. Um, given the social work researchers' um, observation that the context of the tweet is very important to the interpretation. We wanted to explore using the semantic context of what had been said, the emotional context preceding the post, and uh, the user's social network. Um, our method was a word level convolutional neural network and we exploited the unlabeled data first by creating domain specific word embeddings and also creating a lexicon of aggression and loss from that data. So we used the method to automatically induce uh, the lexicon using uh, what's known as the scent prop algorithm. This constructs a lexical graph from word embeddings, connecting words that are semantically similar, and it propagates labels from seed words um, using a random walk. So we started off with a small set of seed words labeled um, by our domain experts, and then propagated that over all of the vocabulary in our corpus. So um, for the context features, uh, we want to represent what the user said, so the word embeddings, this would be semantics, as well as what the user felt, so the, using the aggression or loss lexicon. Um, and you, some of the different hyperparameters that we use are the number of days that we look back in the conversation. Um, Half-life ratio, so whether more recent treat, tweets have more of an impact. Um, the type of the post, and then how we aggregate from the word level to the tweet level to the context, whether we average or whether, for example, we take the max. For the social um, network interactions, we look, we build a representation of each pair of users. Um, where we say a user is involved in a tweet if they posted, retweeted, or mentioned. And for each pair of users in the unlabeled and label corpus, we aggregate all tweets in which they both were involved. And this gives us um, the architecture shown here. It's a standard word level uh, CNN, but at the last layer, we concatenate in context features uh, representing semantics, emotion, and the user interaction. 
So we first looked at the impact of using the domain-specific information, and you can see that's at the bottom. We have, when we use our domain-specific word embeddings, we get the highest F1. Um, and we compared this against using word embeddings uh, built from Google News, where you have much more data than we have. Um, we compared with, well, perhaps if we had a corpus of African-American vernacular English that was larger than ours, it would be better, but that's not the case, and so we are dealing with a language that is uh, very hyper-local um, to our demographic. Uh, we thought maybe tweets that came from the location, the specific location out of which the um, gang members operate would be better, but that is not the case either. Uh, word embeddings trained on Glove Twitter do the best, but uh, still not close. Um, for the hyperparameters, we found that for semantic context, what the user said, 90 days uh, was best, and the half-life ratio was important, so the most recent statements had more impact. Averaging was more important, and we only used self-posts. For what the user felt, however, we saw something quite different. Only the posts in the immediate two days prior um, were helpful. And here we sum. This allows us to retain peaks of emotion. And these findings reflect insights from our social work research team. That is, that loss precedes aggression in a two-day window and emotions fluctuate. Um, if we look at our results, we can see that our CNN with do domain-specific um, resources outperforms our baseline, and this was a baseline de developed in 2016 by an undergraduate working with me, Tara Blevins, who's now a PhD student here at University of Washington. Um, uh, but we get additional significant improvement from adding the context features, and we see that same improvement in our original SVM if we add the context features. Okay, I'm reaching the end, so I'm going to have to very quickly say we also looked at um, bias, and given the interest that we wanted to use this work in a live setting, um, we, w we were concerned with how well the model uh, makes the decision, and we wanted to avoid bias in the learning algorithm. Um, so we did a systematic interpretation of the model, uh, which did reveal bias. Surprisingly, in 10% of the cases, um, the stop word was the most influential word in the tweet, something which should not have an impact at all. We did a adversarial testing, inserting um, a uh, and on into every tweet, and we found that the prediction flips to aggression in 3% of the cases for uh, and 5% of the cases for on, and yet you would never want to have that happen if you were making uh, true predictions. Um, and to reduce bias, we made use of rationales. We had um, the domain expert identify the words within the tweet that led them to their um, label, and then we incorporate those rationales into the model using trained attention. Um, so we uh, have the ground truth for attention, which is distributed over the words of the rationale, and we use KL divergence loss in training. Um, and I'll just point to this first line. Um, our the average rationale rank is a new metric that um, we devised to measure the influence of each word. Um, and we see that more often in our new model with rationales, um, the rationale words are ranked highest with the lowest score. And in our new model, we have the fewest flips to predicting um, aggression when we insert these words. So what have we learned here? Um, measuring bias is important. We didn't change the F measure score, the accuracy, um, but our metrics allowed us to test what kind of bias crept into the model. Um, we see that integrating information from context improves the performance and that we can exploit information from with the um, unlabeled data. 
So in conclusion, I hope to have shown that multilingual and non-standard languages require attention and that uh, we need to pay attention to the data we use, uh, the semantics and real world context in neural architectures as well. And I would close by thanking my current PhD students, one of whom was one of your undergraduates here, Emily Alloway. Um, I had some very talented undergraduates who participated in the Gang Involved Youth, uh, Serena Chang and Risi Zhang, who are now at Stanford and Berkeley. And Yan De Chen is a junior. Um, so he's continuing to do research with us. And then all my past students. So thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So, so thanks for a great talk, um, exciting work. I, um, I want to push back on this, um, this bias thing where you're, you found that the stop words were triggering a flipped decision. Mm -hmm. And I, I was thinking of like, you know, why would this happen? And, and sometimes these little words are, are important, right? So like there's a big difference between uh, John hit Mary and John hit on Mary. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so they often play a role in larger multi-word expressions and completely change the meaning to something that's not, not at all compositional. Yes. So I wonder if you, like, if you, did you dive into those examples to see if it was something like that going on? So we did look at the examples and we really had to have the social work researchers look at the examples. We did think maybe it was something about the language because some of these uh, function words in the language are words like duh for uh or for the and um, so forth. We did not find anything at this point, but it is something that we could look at further. We think, uh, we, we did look at the labels and have social work researchers look at them again. And in fact, they get falsely classified when we use that adversary. So I have one quick question, sorry. Sorry, you go ahead. <laughs> For the cross-language summarization, um, you talked about how training on the uh, like mixed uh, synthetic cor corpora uh, had like better metrics than uh, each language alone. Now I'm wondering, like, why do you think that that's the, the case? So. Um I mean, there's possibly some generalization going across along when we look, you know, from different languages. The difference between the mixed language and the language in which the document originally appeared is quite small. I'm not sure we would say it's significant. It's very close. But the fact that the mixed language corpus helps means that then we can move to use it on other languages that we're not you know, we don't have to have one for every single language pair, so it's helpful from that point of view. So one quick question about the Twitter analysis data. Did you also consider emojis for encoding? Yeah, we have emoji, emojis, they're just words. So each one is treated, it's a character, but it's essentially a word. Thank you. Thank you.